Hi, thanks everybody. Uh, yes, yeah, so I know we might be a bit pushed for time before lunch, so we'll just try to get through a quick question, a few questions. So um, the first question which I'm going to put to the panel is uh, one that was actually in the chat and it was actually during the sepsis talk. So um, it was from a, a colleague who mainly works in adult a and &E, um, uh, requesting, how would you give push dose adrenaline to a child? Okay. Do you, you happy if I take that one? Um, yep, yeah, so there's there's a great resource that covers all this. It's the Pediatric Emergencies website. I, I wrote a post on this uh, a number of years ago. So there's push dose adrenaline is fairly straightforward for a child. You take your normal adrenaline, one in 10,000, take a mill of it and add nine mils of saline. So you've made adrenaline one in 100,000. So it's, it's technically a tenth of the dose you would use in a cardiac arrest. And what you do is you give the dose you would in a cardiac arrest to the child in terms of mils. So 10 kilo child, you would normally give a mil of one in 10,000 in an arrest. The 10 kilo child, you give a mil of that one in 100,000. But because it's really diluted by a strength of 10, you're given a tenth of the dose you would in a cardiac arrest. We do put an upper limit on that. So normally an adult, you would give one to two mils of that solution. So we don't tend to go above the two mils. Uh, and, and that's a fairly simple way of, of doing it. Uh, and that's a great drug to give when you're trying to keep your patient stable um, and you don't have time to make up an adrenaline infusion. Downside of it is you'll give a push of it. It's actually a vasoconstrictor, but you're giving it at an absolutely massive dose. You're giving a mic per kilo as a push. And your normal adrenaline infusion is not, we would normally start at 0.1 mics per kilo per minute. So you're given 10 minutes of a standard infusion just like that. So you will get a you will get a big squeeze in your circulation, but that's generally what you need if your patient is about to arrest, and it's not quite a big a dose as you would give in the arrested patient. Problem is that dose works really well for a short period of time, and then it wears off. Anywhere between a few minutes to ten minutes later, that adrenaline will be gone, and you'll have to repeat it. So there is a wee bit more work in actually monitoring that patient, keeping a finger on the pulse, the blood pressure, cycling regularly. And you're going to have to keep topping that up, but you'll get yourself into a rhythm to do that. If you are having to do that, you're much better to let a syringe pump do that and put them on an infusion. But it, it buys you time so you can get that infusion ready. Um, some other questions just through the chat as well. Um, someone had commented of an acronym PSOFA uh, in sepsis. Is that of any relevance? I'm not aware of um, PSOFA as a... So it's probably... It's probably Q sofa, um, uh, which is not something that we usually use in pediatrics. Is normally practice in adults where you're trying to think from memory. It's like a scoring system, but it's not something that I've ever used in the pediatric world. But uh, um, I'm happy for if anybody else has got experience. No, no, never, never used it. Yeah, we do, we don't tend to use it either. A lot of the scoring systems um, in adults are better validated than they are in children and you know you could get lost in a mine of evidence comparing you know validity studies looking at PSOFA versus PRISM scores, PRISM2 scores, all the rest of it. Um, some centers will use them you know in different ways. Personally I don't. Personally I look at the patient and you know uh, look at their organ function and look at how many organs are failing and yeah you can start thinking about organ assessment tools and and you know multi-organ dysfunction syndrome scores of whatever mode you want uh, it doesn't change what i do but it might be useful later to have conversations with either other teams or families about you know predicted risks when you're talking about you know potential outcomes i think just on from the inotropes there's a question there as well um is it okay to start inotropes via peripheral line and what if i only have a yellow cannula yeah so yes is the answer um, the, you tend to make your infusions up a little bit more dilute. And in terms of anotropes, mostly it's adrenaline. We're starting as our first line. If you're, if you're blind and knowing what's going on with the patient, um, we tend to make it up a little bit more dilute than what you would if you were on the, the central line. And, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to let that patient arrest and then give them a big bolus of adrenaline through the, the same cannula when they've arrested, or you want to give them a little bit of adrenaline and stop them arresting. Um, so I would, I definitely prefer that option. So it's generally as fine. You'd want to make sure it's a good cannula and you'd want to monitor it closely. So don't there's there's a tendency in the ED to bandage all the cannulas up so the kids can't pull them out. I imagine if you're starting adrenaline, this kid's probably too sick to pull their cannula out. So leave it exposed and watch it. 
and keep an eye on the limb. You will definitely get a little bit of tracking up the, the vein, but what you're looking for is to make sure it's not extra visiting. And you 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 should only do it for the minimum amount of time. I uh, came in one morning to find a kid on still running peripheral adrenaline despite the fact they had a central line in, which shouldn't happen. It's it's there till you get your central line for the shortest amount of time possible. But it's it's a life saving treatment. Your other option, of course, is an IO, um, and that's a generally a quicker route into the central circulation than a than a yellow cannula. But by the number of IOs that I've seen extra visit. Recently, I'd probably feel safer with that yellow cannula that I could flush and make sure it was in. I have a, another question here, just um, as well, asking any tips for minimizing the time for time critical transfers? I think the first step is recognizing that you've got a time critical transfer, which is inevitably one of the first issues. Um, you know, an early conversation with your local transport team should help guide you to that conclusion if, if you're not sure. Um, but equally, a transport team, if you do phone them asking for a retrieval, they should be very clear with you that it is time critical and they should be giving you very clear instructions about what is needed and not needed. Um, every transport team is different in terms of how they set up those calls, whether it's conference calls, bringing in your surgery, bringing in the ICU, whatever, you know, it depends where you work. Um, but the, the most important step is recognition. Um, after that, then you have to be very clear within your local team and have a protocol, preferably is if you have a time critical transfer comes in through your ED, who's going, you know, what happens, what's your approach, the staff that leave on that transfer, who's covering them, what happens to the theatre lists, et cetera, et cetera. All of those policies, protocols need to be in place. And if you haven't thought about it as an institution, uh, now would be the time. Would be my first initial thoughts. I have a very good tip that was once taught to me by, um, I imagine Laura might tell me the, the same tip because she trained the same place I did. But a very experienced consultant once told me, when you recognize your, your transfer is time critical, phone the ambulance. Um, if you have paramedics standing at the bottom of the bed, ready to go, that's going to stop you doing anything unnecessary. So the very moment you recognize it, call for your ambulance. And then don't do anything unnecessary to that patient. So in general, an art line, you don't need it. Um, you generate a, a urinary catheter, you don't need it. That's not what's going to save the child's life. So, um, you you want to get moving as soon as you can with that patient safely. And as Peter says, you're going to have to have protocols in place. You're going to have to have drilled it so that you can move that child safely. Yeah. The other thing I was going to say, Chris, is just the communication that the t transfer is time critical to the whole team. So having that shared mental model that you're you're not going to do anything unnecessary and that everybody is aware of that is really important. Yeah, I was just going to say that I um, I think the communication is key here. Just like I said at the end of my talk, when you don't want to send a time critical transfer just to dump on another ED that has to then figure out what's going on. The communication needs to follow all the way through from within your team to the people who are receiving this patient so that you know exactly what's going to happen and what's, where they're going to go so that the neurosurgeon for a traumatic brain injury is standing there waiting for the patient or ready in theatre for them. I know. I, I think, yeah. I quite often should. Or that that decision had, might not have been made by the time you're leaving the district general, and you shouldn't be waiting for it to decide where you're going. You can get in the back of an ambulance with that child while the neurosurgeon's still looking at the scans, and, and communication can then be ongoing about whether you're going to the ICU or whether you're going to the theatre. You know, you don't have yeah. to have that definitive diagnosis confirmed, but obviously the team need to know you're coming. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm not saying that you delay it, but you can. You, those conversations need to be had and that communication needs to be had so that it doesn't start all over again. And, you know, that phone call to the neurosurgeons, the amount of times that I hear about somebody going to CT and they're going to, you know, they say, I'm going to phone the neurosurgeons if there's something on the scan. Well, if it's out of ours and they're coming in from home, you've missed the window, you know, you've delayed this, you know, brain injury by another 30 minutes or so. And it's the same with time critical transfers. Please don't assume that somebody has phoned a neurosurgeon. Please make sure that that actually happens. And don't fall into the trap to think if um, a neurosurgeon says there's nothing for us to do here, it's not a time critical transfer because trauma is not just the head. You know, there's general surgical trauma. Uh, and I, I've been in a situation where the, we delayed transfer because the surgeon, the neurosurgeon wasn't, you know, there was no clear traumatic brain injury. but um, was a ma massive pelvic fracture and lost lots of blood. Um, 
so we fall fell into that trap so trauma is not just the head it's everything else um so and that's time be, critical is time critical that can be tricky for us as candidate because we've both you know from the icu side of things been on calls where from our point of view this is time critical and the dgh team might be uneasy and say i'm not moving this patient because i don't feel comfortable to move the patient they're not the most stable etc cetera, etc cetera. and they would rather wait for a transport team to come out um, and with the best one in the world, that's not the right thing for the patient, you know, and the job of the transport team is, yes, to support, but not to resuscitate, not to intubate, et cetera. Um, and there are important conversations that need to be had uh, that if we're telling the district general hospital that we feel that this is a time critical transfer, then that, you know, the actions have to follow with that. And we understand how uneasy that can make them feel and how mm. difficult that is, but we will support them in the process. Yeah, the, there are geographical exceptions, of course. You know, if the hospital is right next to the uh, transport team or 10, 15 minutes away, there's an argument to be made that in tight critical situations, then you have to go. But that's the exception rather than the rule. Um, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, just with regards to the um, time critical transfers, I've been involved with only a couple, I suppose, but um, I think, yeah, as you were saying, closed loop communication is really important because it wasn't for one of the time critical transfers I was involved in, it was presumed that someone had phoned the ambulance. So I think closed loop communication uh, can use such and such first name, phone the ambulance and let me know when they're phoned because it was 20 minutes later we're waiting on... Um, transferring his child from a district general to Piku and only 20 minutes later um, after discussing with lots of different people that no someone had just assumed that the ambulance was called so there was a unintentional delay there so I think that is important and um, so yeah with regards to what we we're talking about before as well and um, you'd mentioned about IOs Chris and how you said you've seen them fail a lot and um, there was a question just any tips for cases when IOs fail yeah, so uh, I suppose it, it, it's tricky because if, if that's your only port of access, the external jugular is a brilliant resuscitation vein. It's quick. You've got a, a large cannula and you can get a lot of blood off it. So that's when I tell all my trainees, particularly the ones that are working in the emergency department, to practice with. And then outside that, it's just getting skills at ultrasound guided access, although it generally will be slower than an external jugular. And I think if, if it's that emergency situation where you are going for that, then I wouldn't tend to be looking for little small veins with the 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 ultrasound guided line. If your patient's that sick, it would be one of the central veins I would be going for with it. You know, rather you're putting a cannula into a little peripheral vein and a kitty shut down is a slow process. The, the commonest mistake I see with that IOs is um, apart from the sizing, I mean, obviously the smaller size, the pink is only for, you know, I think the, the guidance is wrong. I think three to four kilos, that's probably your limit. Anything more than that, you need to size up. Uh, I think it's the blue one, the next up. But the commonest mistake is when the team fail and then they get into the temptation of removing the old one. Don't remove the old one. The, the bone is a hollow tube. So if you remove the old one, everything you push into the next one, if it goes in the same bone, it's just going to hose out from the other side. So if you do remove it, You've taken that limb completely out of contention for using it for another IEO attempt. And um, so just leave it in uh, is the best advice I'd give you. You can go under it uh, if you want to use the same bone, especially in big, um, you know, if it's a trauma and you've got a broken bone, you can't use that anyway. So if you're going to go in the other bone that's not broken, just leave the old IEO in if it doesn't work and go under it or, or over it. That's a good tip. I haven't heard that before, but it, it, it's what you will do with the center line. Sometimes if you are if you think you've missed it with the cannula, quite often you leave that old cannula in because it, if you pull it out, it, it bleeds everywhere and you get a hematoma. So if you leave the one you've missed in and then put another one alongside it, you have a bigger target to go for and then take it out after you've got the center line in. Um, another question here from uh, an anesthetic colleague um, saying... Is ketamine and rock what we should use for all our intubations? I think we're, we're going to talk about seizures a little bit later on because there there has been a bit of a change to the APLS guideline um, in that ketamine's become the one that's listed first. Um, I would have some concerns about using it first line in that particular instance, but um, 
I don't know if we're going to cover that later on. I suppose we could do it. We could do it now. Um, any any situations you wouldn't use ketamine because we use it for head injuries now. That's um, we don't believe that it increases intracranial pressure, and it's more important to preserve your your blood pressure. Um, asthma, it's good for. Um, Standard, I use fentanyl ketamine rock. That's what I use, and it works well. Mm-hmm. And there are very few circumstances where I would be pushed not to use that. What, so, what about seizures, Peter? Sorry. What about seizures? Seizures, I'm very happy with ketamine. There's loads of evidence that it's the ketamine infusions are used for super refractory epilepsy yeah. syndromes. So again, not a, not a reason not to use it. So, you know, for me using fentanyl ketamine rock um, in, you know, even my post-op cardiac patients who are cardiovascularly unstable at times, um, it works well and it's relatively safe. It's what I'm used to using. I know what to expect from it. And there are very few circumstances where I will not want to do that. I might have to adjust doses. I might have to give it more time, depending on what, what else is going on with the patient. But for me, fentanyl ketamine rock is a relatively safe approach. I would no, certainly, like, I, I'm not a fan of thiopentone for seizures, but propofol would be my go-to unless there's a reason to go other words. And, and we, 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 this was, we were chatting about this this week with this coming up, and I think most of the intensivists were at a similar feeling that propofol would be our go-to drug unless there was, you know, something that was discouraging us, like a low blood pressure, in, in which days ketamine, for us, that's when ketamine came in, because I agree with you, most of the evidence is for refractory seizures in the ICU where you know, the ketamine seems to work well, but rather than using it as that initial induction agent, propofol is what we have feel a little bit more comfortable with when you... Why? Uh, Why do you feel more safe with propofol rather than ketamine? Because we have that experience of using it for that purpose. You know, we, again, it's, if you're asking me to do potentially something that I haven't done before, you know, I've done it in a clapped out seizure patient who I'm worried is going to arrest, but then I watch them very closely to make sure they've stopped filling. And again, that's maybe one of the other things we're going to come up in the, the chat later how do you tell they've stopped uh-huh. um i but, mean i think if you're if you're worried about propofol and the, the hypotension that will inevitably ensue that you won't get with with ketamine you know if you've talked about what you're used to is there a reason not to become used to fentanyl ketamine rock that's yeah. the question i would sort of i think i would like to see the evidence that it it terminates seizures as well as propofol i know there's evidence for it used long term in the ICU when your patient's refractory and it, it's one of those adjuncts you can add in that works very well but I just don't know about that acute induction um, and I suppose you, you've you you've treated hundreds of kids season and you give the propofol and you, you know what it does and you know how it works and I just don't have that feeling with ketamine although if I change to it maybe I will get that feeling that it works yeah I mean I think with all of those uh, agents that you're using if you're using a rock you need to be very clear that you may not have stopped the seizures underneath what you've given anyway so um you know you can give propofol and you feel like you put the kid to sleep you've also given them rock so you, how are you going to know that that seizure has actually stopped that's the same problem with ketamine and propofol depending on whether you've got EEG CFAM or whatever um so that I would argue might potentially be falsely reassuring if you don't have that neuro monitoring in place Funnily enough, it comes up in my talk. How do you how do you change the perceptions? Because as the person often leading the resuscitation, I'll be saying, in this instance, I prefer ketamine and rock uranium, whereas the anesthetist or the trainee will say, I'm more comfortable with propofol. And as I'm the one doing the intubation, this is the agent I'm going to use. What do you think needs to change for I, us I, to go? I don't, I don't think it necessarily has to change, Stephen. I, I, I think the, the, the guideline very clearly says ketamine or propofol or, or thiopentone um you know so or sorry actually it's ketamine or thiopentone or propofol the opposite order i would probably use them in so that you, you've still got your choice there and with the last guidance they changed to include ketamine in the algorithm for the first time and it was meant for those clapped out seizures they didn't want somebody given propofol to and they've just slightly changed it again with this addition bringing ketamine to the front of it but you've still got the three options but not even outside um, seizures, so the trauma patient, the head injury patient, I'd often still encounter a preference for propofol from the A person. Um, and in the resuscitation room, you, you don't want to be starting an argument. So it always goes down to if that's the agent you're comfortable with, you're the one doing the procedure, then I'll default to you. But do you think there does need to be a switch in that we need to be thinking more of ketamine for induction agents? Do you think it's okay as it is? How big of an argument should I be having at the foot of the bed? 
is uh, part of the question. I think in terms of propofol, the only condition I give propofol to is seizures. Um, everything else is ketamine. I think we can all agree that probably is, you know, we're, it's it's probably seizures is the only indication where we're doing it. And if somebody's trying to give a trauma patient, you know, um, propofol, it, it, you probably are rightly st- stepping in and saying, are you sure you want to do that? And in fact, actually, I'd rather we used ketamine because there's actually risk of harm. And that would be my thoughts on it. You, as the team leader, you would have to interject there. Somebody may be more comfortable with it, but actually your patient might be more comfortable if you use ketamine. I think you pick your battles. Um, you, you know, you if you have a... Sometimes the, the, the difference of opinion is down to A, experience, um, and B, preference. So unless I have a strong suspicion that whatever the my colleague is going to give is going to cause harm to the patient, I let them run with it. Because essentially the best anaesthetic is the one someone can titrate because of experience and, uh, you know, and, and, and because they know how it reacts, because that's the main, their go-to drug. Yeah, you know, I, I I've agree. been in situations with a bad, you know, status epilepticus where the child was actually fully septic when I, I've pulled what little hair I've got left trying to tell them not to use star pentone. Um, and sometimes they listen and when they when they don't listen, things go horribly wrong and then they learn in retrospect. So you need to fight that battle when it needs to be fought if you think it's going to harm the patient. But if it's a stable patient, largely whether you ketamine or propofol is down to a soft preference or sort of a slight academic uh, disagreement um that's all there is to it so essentially pick your battles is my approach yeah you can't you know from a medical legal ethical point of view you can't force me to administer a drug that i don't believe in that i'm not happy to give so if i'm giving an anesthetic and i'm the one that's taking ownership of that role then i'm giving the anesthetic that i feel is appropriate Now, you might say to me, I'm worried about the hypotension or whatever that propofol will induce. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. If that happens, we will do X, Y, or Z, and you plan for that. And that's fine. But if I'm given the anesthetic and that's my role, then I'm taking that ownership of that. So I'd obviously trust you, Peter, but I've been involved in serious head injuries where the anaesthetist decided he wanted to do a gas induction um, with a drop in blood pressure from 120 to 60. And since then, I'm much more attuned to what's going on in the the a end and what agents are going to use and it, it is just difficult and i think it is about having that dialogue and trying to share uh, the decision making but i usually default to whatever the a person's saying unless i think it's completely off the cuff but i think that's it isn't it if you think there's a genuine safety concern like somebody given you know a gas induction in, a, in that sort of setting then you know you you have your medical legal ethical responsibility is to challenge that and then you do say to them, you know, have you, I'm not happy unless you speak to your consultant about, about that decision because that's not something that I can support. It, it was the consultant. Oh, <laughs> Which, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's completely inappropriate to have a gas induction and a head injury um, for multiple reasons. Also, what I tell me, so the subsequent drop in blood pressure by 50 systolic uh, definitely changed the feeling of the room. But uh, it's good <laughs> to hear everyone's opinion. And the problem and is as well, you're dilating all the veins in the head, so all the blood's going up to the head, and there's no pre- there's no blood pressure, and also the airways at risk as well of aspiration. So it's completely wrong. And was there a debrief after that, Stephen, that allowed people to have that conversation? There's a couple more here. Um, let me see. Maybe a burns question, just because we've covered some things a wee bit. Um, it said for children with burns, are we still using cling film? Have you oh. answered that in the chat? Um, uh, we do use cling film for our burns. It limits uh, fluid loss and it also gives good pain relief and a barrier. Um, so cling film is used quite frequently in our burns. Yeah, and all the guidance would support us. If you take off a little bit of a roll, it's pretty much sterile. Um, definitely use it. Obviously, be concerned for circumferential. So if you put it around the limb too tight, you can cause kind of not like a tamponade, but you can cause um, a decrease with venous return and um, an issue with perfusion from that end. But loosely fine cling film is, is brilliant. The thing I find about it is that it does anything but cling. Uh, 